Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out tonight, especially on a gorgeous night like this. I bet you'd all like to be outside. I know I would. Uh, you guys are great for coming out on this beautiful night and coming into here. I think what's going to be a really, really interesting conversation tonight. Um, I'm Catherine O'Day, the Executive Director at Save Our Shores. And before I introduce our esteemed speakers, I just want to make a couple of announcements about upcoming events at Save Our Shores. So earlier this month, hopefully some of you who get our newsletter saw this, um, we launched our Climate Information and Action Portal, which you can find at sosclimate.saveourshores.org. It's really worth checking out. There's a lot of information on there. There's a lot of things you can do uh, to reduce your own carbon footprint. There's curriculum for teachers. It's really a, a pretty exciting uh, portal for all things related to climate change in the ocean. So please check that out. We also launched a brand new initiative, which is our youth leadership movement. And we're calling that SOS Wave Makers. So this is the next generation of folks who are going to come ahead of, you know, after us, us who have failed to solve the problems of climate change and ocean plastics and everything that's going wrong with our planet. Uh, they are going to be the next generation. They're going to be the ones facing some of the worst uh, impacts of things like climate change and in our dying ocean and so we are trying to empower them we are creating this group so that they can engage in civil discourse so that they can become advocates and even activists for issues around climate change plastic pollution um, ocean acidification all things related to what i consider our two most important life-giving resources which is our ocean and our planet so we're really excited about that Stay tuned, it just got launched. We're going to see some really exciting action from our youth across both Santa Cruz and Monterey County. And then also since a lot of tonight's um, conversation is going to be about climate change, I just wanted to remind you all, in case you don't know, that a week of climate action is coming up, September 20th through 27. It'll be kicked off with the next global climate strike. Uh, Save Our Shores will be engaged in various activities throughout that week. So watch our calendar, stay, uh, pay attention to our email blasts and social media, and come on out and be part of this next opportunity to tell our leaders that it's really beyond time to take action. So tonight we're going to have a conversation about putting the blue in the Green New Deal. And we have two awesome speakers who have come up with this concept, which is a policy initiative. We have Jason Scorst and David Helvard. And Jason is an associate professor and the program chair for international environmental policy at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. At Middlebury, he teaches courses in environmental and natural resource economics, ocean and coastal economics, and behavioral economics. Jason is also the director of the Center for the Blue Economy, which provides leadership and research, education, and analysis to promote a sustainable ocean and coastal economy. Yeah, yay. <laughs> David Helvard is the executive director of the Blue Frontier and the author of six books, Blue Frontier, The War Against the Greens, 50 Ways to Save the Ocean, Rescue Warriors, Saved by the Sea, and the Golden Shore. He is editor of the Ocean and Coastal Conserva Conservation Guide and the organizer of Blue Vision Summits for Ocean Activists. An award-winning journalist, he produced more than 40 broadcast documentaries for PBS, the Discovery Channel, and others. So please join me in welcoming our esteemed speakers, and enjoy the conversation tonight. Thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. My name is Emily. I'm the program manager with Save Our Shores. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you to our speakers as well. Um, also want to give a thank you to the Green Inn for having us here this evening. So I'd love to start out by 
just hearing a little bit about each of your career paths and what brought you to want to get involved with this concept of the, the blue economy. Yeah, hi. So uh, I actually went to UC Santa Cruz as an undergraduate. I was in environmental studies back in the 80s, fun 80s, and uh, got involved really in ocean policy then. And then I did my doctoral degree at Berkeley in economics and uh, really wasn't super focused on the oceans, but I got recruited to do some economic work for the oceans uh, about 12, 13 years ago. And then we got some money and started the Center for the Blue Economy. And so it's really kind of the missing link, I think, is the economic piece for a lot of people and the social science piece. So, you know, I like to kind of say that, you know, economists, uh, for all their, 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 their negative sides and the bad sides, we've kind of known what we need to do to solve climate change for about 30 years. Uh, it's really the, the innovations and the implementation that's for doing it. It's not, we know what we need to do. You know, if you made me the environmental dictator of the world, I could solve it in probably 24 hours in terms of just putting the policies in place. So. We're really into the action, and that's kind of what we're here to talk about tonight. Yeah, and I, um, I mean, I agree. I will say we know what the solutions are. It's creating the political will to enact them, and that's what we're about. I mean, I started out like Jason. I grew up in New York, which is a city that's 80% disconnected from the continental United States. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's a water town, and you don't sort of realize it until moments like 9-11 when the Coast Guard organized the largest maritime evacuation in world history. Half a million people left Manhattan by boat, working boats, tugboats, ferries. Um, I grew up and I remember, you know, growing up with uh, C. Hunt and uh, Jacques Cousteau and my Mrs. Olson, my fourth grade teacher, brought these big sawfish bills to class that her father, sea captain, had uh, killed these fish and made me realize that Long Island was actually an island. And, uh, you know, some 40 years later when my book, 50 Ways to Save the Ocean, came out, I was talking to these fourth graders in New York and one of them raised her hand. Because, well, what is it, honey? Because, is that a real island? Because, what a real island? What you said Brooklyn and Queens was a part of? So, um, I, I, I grew up thinking, you know, that I grew up to be like a frogman and save dolphins in America and then an oceanographer. And then I get distracted by the movements and moments in my youth in the 1960s. Ended up being a... a war reporter and a, you know, environmental journalist and a private investigator and sort of spending all my time going off to cover, you know, wars and epidemics and uh, run special circumstance death penalty cases so I could go home and body surf. And eventually I got to uh, write my second book on the ocean that I always loved. And uh, as I say, after, um, and that was right around the time Blue Frontier came out, right when the uh, I had one of those life changes. I lost my partner and didn't know what to do next. I thought I'd go back. This is when George Bush was ginning up to invade Iraq. I figured I'd go back to war reporting because I knew that was a good, um, you know, good way to uh, deal with depression. Um, <laughs> but then I got this, you know, Ralph Nader called and he said, you know, the last chapter of the book is called The Seaweed Rebellion. All these marine grassroots folks with solutions, but how do you scale them up? Um, and I thought, well, we're always going to have war if we're not always going to have uh, healthy reefs or, or uh, kelp forests. And, and so I thought, uh, plus I inherited Nancy's cat, and I didn't know what to do with the cat if I went off to war. So <laughs> the, the Bruce who didn't even like getting her paws wet decided me on, a, you know, on an opportunity to get back to the ocean and uh, save the love that, uh, that was still there. And the last 15 years has been about um, how we do that, how we organize uh, the seaweed rebellion and grow it out. And we've done it with uh, you know, Peter Bench, the Ocean Awards and Blue Vision Summits and Healthy Ocean Hill Days and passing legislation. We've now had to our second global march for the ocean to fight plastic and oil drilling and, and to deal with climate. And now, again, it's the political will. Now I'm, I'm partnered up with Jason and the Center for the Blue Economy. Blue Frontier is partnered to talk about the ways where we can uh, bring, bring the blue into the red, white, and blue in terms of climate solutions. And uh, we're hoping that, uh, you know, Sea Party 2020 will help turn the tide, get a new government in that believes in science and believes in reality, and then start dealing with it. Thank you very much both for sharing. So, the document that you both collaborated on was in response to this Green New Deal. And I'm sure that we've all heard about the Green New Deal, but 
Um, just to provide a little bit of background, this document was a resolution that was passed by Senator Ed Markey and uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in response to really this massive, large-scale issue of climate change, really a climate crisis that we're experiencing. Um, and it was developed, um, it, sorry, it requires rapid response, um, really these large-scale changes and actions and huge shifts in the way that we are carrying out our society. Things like massive switches for decarbonization, uh, moves to renewable energy systems, changing our agricultural systems, and much more. It also offers a lot of protection for our people, um, job security and training and education for those who may lose their job in these massive industrial shifts, as well as universal health care. And a large portion of this document also focuses on reducing um, and mitigating some of these really systemic inequalities that have kind of persisted through our society. So the main goals of the Green New Deal is to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions through a fair and a just transition to all communities and workers, to create millions of good high wage jobs and ensure prosperity and economic security for all people of the United States, to invest in the infrastructure and industry of the United States to sustainably meet the challenges of the 21st century, to secure for all people of the United States for generations to come, clean air and water, climate and community resiliency, healthy food, access to nature, a sustainable environment, and the final goal, to promote justice and equity by stopping current, preventing future, and repairing historic oppression of indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth. So it's really this quite well-rounded document um, and resolution that encourages future policies. Can you both provide some more information on your document and how um, perhaps some of the aspects of blue economy that you feel are missing from the Green New Deal? Sure, so uh, just to, to start here, you know, I've been, I've been in, in climate policy for about 20 years, and the Green New Deal, the first thing is, is it, it isn't policy yet, right? So it's a, it's a kind of an overview document and, uh, of what the goals of a kind of comprehensive industrial shift would be. There have been criticisms that it's a little too encompassing if you look at that list. Each of those you know, problems have persisted for decades, if not centuries, and so to kind of lump them together, Putting that aside for a second, I think the one thing that the Green New Deal has really done that is, that is outstanding is it is putting justice at the center of the environmental movement, right? The environmental movement for a long time has really been focused on kind of, you know, conservation goals that kind of don't look at, you know, what are the actual impacts on people and, and, and vulnerable communities? What are the quality of the jobs that are coming out of that? Is it fair? You know, the industries that shift, the new industries that we create, are those being developed fairly, the ones that we leave behind? And so the justice is really front and center in this. And I think that is a really great development. And I think we're not going to ever go backwards again. I think the environmental movement and environmental justice will be two sides of the same coin from here on out, where it really hasn't been for a long time. So in terms of our kind of initial thoughts on this, when, what, what we, when David and I were talking, the thinking here is, is that if there is a window to do comprehensive climate policy in, say, 2021, it's going to be a short window. As you all know, the U.S., the way the U.S. system works uh, and the way with midterms and with, the, if you don't know about the kind of structural impediments to policy with the filibuster and the Senate and all kinds of committees, we don't get we're not like a normal parliamentary system where we get to work on things continually. We get this one or two years. So our thinking was, if the ocean community doesn't have a plan ready to go in 2021, chances are it's going to get left out. Because the Green New Deal is mostly being written by and focused on terrestrial thinking for climate change. So we said, OK, we looked around. We said, is anyone doing this? Is anyone in the ocean community trying to put together what the ocean component of this would look like so that we can be ready to roll? And the answer was no. We didn't see anyone doing that. And so 
as you know, two New Yorkers, we said, if no one else is doing it, then, then let's do it. So we, we started the conversations. I want to be clear here, we're just starting the conversation. We don't have a plan, we don't have comprehensive legislation, anything like that, but we started by kind of outlining what we thought were kind of the eight big components that would make up the blue part of the Green New Deal. I'll pass it on to Dave now to kind of outline some of those. We're going to be following up, though. We're having a meeting in, in October in Monterey at the Center for the Blue Economy, bringing together a lot of California leaders to start flushing out some of this detail. The goal is to have a meeting in D.C. in next spring and have it more national and have, uh, you know, uh, at that point, have a consensus document that the ocean community can bring to presidential campaign. As a nonpartisan institute, we will bring it to the Trump campaign. You know, we can take bets on the chance that they will pay attention to that. But, you know, hell can freeze over, so we're going to bring it to them. And so, you know, our, our thinking is we just want to have a consensus document that's ready to go for that short window that we all are going to work towards in the next couple years. So I'll pass it to David. He can talk a little bit more about the details of kind of the outline of what we're thinking about. Right. So I started, as a journalist, I started covering climate change when Roger Revelle explained it to me in the 1980s. And, um, and, and in terms of ocean crisis, we've talked about these cascading disasters of industrial overfishing, of oil, chemical, nutrient, and plastic pollution, of loss of habitat, and climate change. But we've reached a point now where climate change is overwhelming all the other threats in that and changing the physical nature of the ocean in terms of its, its circulation, its chemistry, its temperature, its color. Um, and, and so, you know, in addressing the climate crisis, we have to look at what's happening on our shores and in our waters. I mean, a, a warmer, more acidic ocean also holds less dissolved oxygen, which impacts everything. You know, it's fine if you're a microbial gnat or a jelly, but not so good if you're like a bony fish or a mammal or one of those algae that give us 50 to 80 percent of our oxygen. So, you know, we're in this moment of crisis, and what can we do? What can we do at the national level in the United States? Um, we do great in California, and yet we're seeing the, the tremendous impacts. I was just up in, in Fort Bragg, and basically we've lost all the kelp. 98 percent of the kelp north of the Golden Gate has gone away in the last three years. It's a cascading impact largely driven by warming temperatures and their impacts on our ecosystems. So. We're looking at some very basic uh, issues that have broadly been recognized as problems, things like the National Flood Insurance Program, which since 1968 has been a driver of overdevelopment, pushing people onto the beachfront, and basically paying people to rebuild in harm's way. It's been, in terms of equity, it's been lower income people in the interior now paying second homeowners on barrier islands, storm barrier islands, to rebuild their rental units. Um, and, uh, as a developer who actually built behind the dunes in Florida said, it's, you know, fe uh, uh, the federal national flood insurance programs made stupidity feasible, made it possible for people to start building on the sand, on the beach, on the barrier islands. Uh, we want to reformulate it. We want to start moving that money. It's $20 billion in debt. Um, Florida, it's, it's driven the, the private insurance sector won't insure people who put, put themselves in harm's way, and so the federal taxpayers are now taking that burden where it's becoming unfeasible. States like Florida are providing insurance pools that are going to bankrupt the state of Florida. So it's sort of a rush between bankruptcy, drowning, and being poisoned by the harmful algal blooms that are directly attributable to big ag. Um, and, and so, you know, there are ways to, to shift that, to shift it where we begin doing planned retreat. You have programs like in New Jersey where the state will come in after a storm, after a Sandy or, or you know, the next inevitable storm, come in and offer to willing buyers to buy back at the pre-storm real estate value. So you're making the homeowner whole, but at the same time you're taking out that house and restoring the, the natural infrastructure, which is a second part of our, of our program, investing in infrastructure for $20 trillion dollars put $100 billion into the living infrastructures, into the, the dunes and the salt marshes and uh, the seagrass meadows that can both protect us from the next storm impacts while at the same time providing all these ecological services and sequestering carbon. 
So investing in those kind of systems, restoring uh, the wetlands, restoring the, the coral reefs and the, and the oyster reefs and the, the habitats that are essential, and making those investments, retreating from the shore, making people whole as you retreat so that it's, it's something communities understand. And, and these are all very doable. There's a recognition that the system we have doesn't work. Um, we're talking about working waterfronts and how to maintain them. We're talking about recognizing that, that fisheries are, are moving with the temperatures, fish are moving towards the poles, and how do you maintain uh, fishing communities and how do you transition them to sustainable uh, you know, sea farming. And, and you know, even the eighth point, e even how we respond to disaster. I mean, I read a whole book called Rescue Warriors on the Coast Guard. Um, things that maybe the average environmentalist doesn't think of, like creating, um, we've got a cyber warfare, there, there are 10 um, combatant combans in the Department of Defense in the Pentagon. The most recent was cyber warfare, before that it was Africa Corps. Um, created disaster response um, combatant command in the DOD because right now uh, we're, not, we're not able to respond at the scale that's needed. Um, you look at something, when I was writing my first book on the environmental backlash in the 90s, War Against the Greens, the California Department of Forestry, the big conflict was between uh, timber and habitat. Um, by the drought, the California Department of Forestry became the California Department of Forestry and Fire Prevention. Today we know it as Cal Fire. They spend $2 billion a year fighting the climate impacts of, uh, of climate-driven uh, forest fires. Uh, we have a new report by the state that says the cost of sea level rise is going to be much greater than these fires. But even last year, a thousand, uh, under mutual aid, a thousand fire trucks were requested and not delivered because local firefighting departments wanted to keep them at home because of the local fires that were happening. Um, so we have to scale up disaster response, and the only people with deep enough pockets right now are the folks who have $800, million, $800 billion in the Department of Defense. But um, you know, these are just some of the ideas that we're putting out there. And our real thinking is bringing in all the stakeholders, the environmentalists, the maritime industries, you know, the, the greening ports folks from LA Long Beach, um, bring in the policymakers, and start making sure that when we have a climate plan, it incorporates our, our coast and our ocean. Thank you. So you brought up this um, program in New Jersey, the Blue Acres program, which basically is moving homes out of flood-prone areas so that you can instead take those homes away and implement um, various mitigation strategies like wetland buffers um, and things of that nature to prevent and mitigate the impacts of floods rather than consistently repairing homes that are damaged by floods. Um, and when I look around our coastline, especially here in Santa Cruz, you walk around West Cliff or East Cliff and these homes that are built right on the cliff sides um, are not going to be there um, in a very short amount of time, even as soon as 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so I'm just wondering, how do you foresee a program like that being feasible here, um, especially when so many of these houses are very, very expensive, millions of dollars, people spend their whole lives working to purchase a home like that, um, and then where would the funding come from for that, for the government or another entity to be able to purchase those homes back to be able to perform some type of managed retreat where folks could recede back from the shoreline? Yeah, so I, I won't, we, we don't claim to have the full answer to that, right? Those are very difficult questions, and it's probably not going to be a one-for-one, one, right? You have your $10 million Westcliff home that's threatened, and you're probably not going to get, we're not going to have the money. There's no way to have the money to pay everyone to dollar for dollar. But there are some interesting thinking, right? So the first thing could be if you got, you know, if you had property that was moved back, maybe you get some extra development rights on that property. So you could maybe raise the value of land that you were, was in exchange. You could also do things like maybe create, if we're going to restore living, you know, the shorelines where the homes are moved from, you can get some, maybe some conservation easements and get some type of, uh, you know, get some tax breaks on future income and future wealth through that. So there are ways to kind of do some of the cost sharing, and I think that's what we're going to have to think about. You know, you just said, you know, probably these, these homes in West Cliff and East Cliff won't be here very soon, but, you know, a lot of these people will, if they're allowed to, and this is where also the legal system comes in, they will spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and put the riprap rocks in front of it to protect it for decades more. 
and so there are some pretty strong property rights issues that we have to navigate here because even in progressive California, there's a very, very strong, uh, you know, it's my property, I get to do whatever I want with it, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter if it has negative impacts on the neighbors or on the larger ecosystem. So this is going to be a, a long process. This is not a, an easy thing to do, but I think there's, there's enough that we know that works. There's enough of kind of cost sharing and uh, you know, opportunities that I think we could come up with something that's at least fair and equitable that everybody is maybe, if not made whole, at least feels that they got a fair deal. But again, I, I don't want to claim that we're going to, everyone is going to be financially whole at the end of this, right? That's, that's probably, that would be uh, probably an overstatement. But, you know, one of the things we have, so we've seen the private insurance sector is already out of there. We've got a lot of federal subsidies. Um, California has taken a long-term perspective in terms of when we created the Coastal Commission. You're not supposed to just be putting riprap and gun ice on your cliff. You know, we understand that this is a public, you know, a public shoreline. And because, you know, as much as it stopped bad development, the, the maybe strongest part of the California Coastal Commission Act was public access. Because Californians have the sense of entitlement. It belongs to all of us. And therefore, it's not, you know, when it's not like a property claim so much as a public challenge. And some of those challenges are immediate in terms of here and Pacifica and along Sunset Cliffs where I used to live in San Diego. And those are the immediate challenges. Others like uh, South Bay and, and San Francisco Bay, the South Bay restoration of salt marshes is both um, an investment to protect both low-income Hispanic community that's right adjacent to uh, to Google and Apple and some of the highest end uh, tech sector industries. And so the investments and people looking at like lateral walls, seawalls, you know, the, the building, I mean, two of the three Bay Area major airports are at risk of flooding. Um, you can build seawalls, but for one third of the price, you can build, build up, rebuild the salt marshes and uplands that can provide the protection and provide all these additional services. So starting to look at, uh, you know, they're, they're going to harden southern Manhattan. I mean, that's just going to, they're going to put a seawall in there. But on the other side, on the Jersey Shore, you can't do that for the whole Jersey Shore. And so people are building apartments in, in Hoboken with a tile on the first floor for repeat flooding. I mean, I recommend reading New York 2140 because there's a sort of dystopic, dystopic future with some hope in it. And I think that's what we're facing, a dystopic future with some hope. It's science fiction. For nonfiction, I've got some books in the back. <laughs> Thank you. It's really amazing how um, far out of our way we'll go to continue to live in the path of nature's destruction, even though we know what's coming. But instead of going somewhere else, we choose to put tiles on our floors. It's funny. Um, so continuing the conversation about sea level rise and adaptation strategies around that, I think what comes to mind most frequently is this concept of seawalls or levees, um, putting the riprap there to protect the cliffs. Um, but your proposal discusses um, this concept of living shorelines. Can you elaborate on what living shorelines are and how you think they'll help mitigate some of the impacts of climate change? Sure. So we, the center actually, we did a study for uh, Bain Capital, it's not a, uh, or Bain Consulting, sorry, not Bain Capital, the one that Mitt Romney did. Uh, we did Bain Consulting up in, in the city, and they, they had some money with the Nature Conservancy to think about a, coming up with a kind of cap and trade or a kind of permitting system that would incentivize living shorelines. And so living shorelines, again, are all kind of ecological-based systems that can give storm protection and sea level rise protection in lieu of hardened gray infrastructure, right? So that would be the kind of the general view of this. And so we did a study on this of like, what would it take to start incentivizing this instead of a seawall? We went into it thinking that it would be it's more expensive to do a dune or eelgrass or something like that than do a seawall. And we actually found out that's not the case. Now, the funny thing is when we presented this to the Bain people, they're, you know, they're straight finance people. They said, well, if it's cheaper to do natural infrastructure, why isn't everyone doing it? it you, you must be wrong. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. And what we found was, is it's not that, uh, it's not the price mechanism. It's that people don't really trust it. People, like if you want, if you have a house and you want to get it protected with a seawall, there's 10 engineering firms that can give you detailed specs, computer models, 
give you the maintenance cost, everything. If you want the dune system or the eelgrass or the marsh, there's no, there aren't 10 ecological design firms that can come and show you all their test plots and the case studies and the neighbors you can talk to. They don't have the detailed economics. But even though when you dig down, it's cheaper, we don't have the institutional kind of memory and we don't have the infrastructure to that, that people can compare side by side and say, oh, wow, because most people would choose it. So a big part of this will be non-economic in the sense that we need, we need test cases. We need some public money, some research, do some test cases, show it, and have people who are contemplating this go talk to the neighbors, go talk to people, spread by word of mouth. Then we get some long-term longitudinal studies, and we can say, this has withstood the test of time. We have the cost of the, how much it costs to maintain it, and it's cheaper than the seawall. So there's just the kind of some institutional long-term memory because we've been doing things one way. And the, but again, the upside here is, is that it actually is economic. And if we can change the paradigm, the economics will flow very quickly, and we could see people move away from the, the gray infrastructure pretty quickly. And, and you know, speaking of cognitive dissonance, um, Louisiana, which is an oil colony, also has a multi-billion dollar program to restore the wetlands. And this is sort of the model of, they recognize that seawalls don't work. Um, I got to see how they recognized it when I was down there in 2005 after Katrina. And so the state's investing billions in trying to get matching funds from the federal government because they already have the proof and the experience that for every mile of, of salt marsh, uh, you take a, a foot of the flood surge down. And, or it's, excuse me, every eight miles. They had 140 miles of protection. Now they're down to like 14 in places. And so they're trying to, you know, get the river back into its natural state from where the Army Corps of our engineers, um, you know, kind of, the Army Corps has kind of spent the last half century channeling a warrior and a beaver and straightening out every river they could. Now they're committed to the next 50 years of, of undoing the damage they did. But so oddly, you have to look to Louisiana to see a kind of scaled application of natural restoration versus seawalls. And in a way, California, even though we're not great at it yet. Um, we're kind of the counter model to, to uh, the Netherlands. Holland has got 600 years of experience building walls, and they're now selling that technology from New York to Bangladesh, trying to essentially sell big sea walls and hardened structures as a solution to sea level rise. And oddly, following Louisiana, California is looking at, at other models of how we do restoration. Not easy. I mean, I live in Richmond where we have this beautiful 400-acre headland that's a high-hazard high fire zone, but it's also a natural wonder. It's the last gem, undeveloped gem on the bay. And it's got 50 acres of the most pristine eelgrass beds. Our mayor wants to sell it off to uh, Sun Cal, a Southern California real estate developer, to you know build 2,200 units of housing where pre in a deal that he cut with the failed casino developer. So wherever the sort of undeveloped land, instead of recognizing it as a protective resource and barrier, um, you're, you're confronted by the sort of traditional thinking. You know, you hire an a, economist, as we did, to do the due diligence the city hasn't done, and it says the city will lose $3 million a year because you have to build a fire substation, and you bring in the scientists who say you lose the most pristine eelgrass beds that are used for restoration for the other 2,000 acres, and we bring in the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations, the biggest commercial fishing group, to say those eelgrass beds are also nursery for Dungeness crab. For uh, it, it's where the um, um, the bay uh, forage fish lay their eggs, and, and so sort of recognizing the economic values of the natural systems versus just pouring concrete over them is the challenge. That's why we have places like the Center for the Blue Economy. Um, to recognize that we're in a new situation, we have to have new economic models. And as Jason said, they're models that don't exist at the scale where people can do a side-by-side -side comparison yet. And legislation also drives, uh, drives the economy. I mean, you know, you can, you know, on problems like, you know, the market's great for like making sure there's enough gasoline for the Christmas, ho you know, holiday season. But when you have existential threats like the rise of fascism or the nuclear balance of terror or climate change, you need government. And so we need government to create the incentives and, and 
draw the shifts in market that have to take place to address uh, the, the challenges of climate on our shore. Thank you. So in response to this need for an industrial shift towards renewables, states like New York and Massachusetts have started investing in these pretty large scale offshore wind um, production uh, projects. So despite some of the barriers that your proposal outlines to these types of projects, what investments has California made or is California planning to make in the area of offshore wind um, energy production? Yeah, so there's a, a big um, potential offshore wind being talked about outside Mor Morro Bay right now. That would be the first and largest one off California. There's some issue because um, the Navy does a lot of testing and a lot of exercises off the coast there. And so they're a little worried that that might interfere with that. So again, you get into big issues that can't be resolved at a local level when you have the federal government and national security concerns. And uh, so if this does go through, I think there's some encouraging signs that it will. The, the, the next thing is we've got to start building the transmission lines. Again, so you know, to have you know, gigawatts and megawatts of, uh, of offshore power, you need the transmission to get them to the population centers. Those are big infrastructure projects. Those are billions of dollars. Uh, again, that we need the siting for these things, right? So as many of you probably know, you know the, the land is very zoned. You, know, you can go to the county planning office here and look exactly at every parcel of Santa Cruz. Is it residential, commercial? The ocean, we don't have the equivalent of that. We have some rough sketches, but we really haven't mapped out you know, the ocean uses yet, what's compatible, where we should put what. So that is definitely going to be part of what we're um, putting forth for this Ocean Climate Action Plan. It's much more comprehensive kind of mapping so that, and this gives certainty to investors and, you know, and policymakers, hey, we can do the X and Y here, this is what it's meant to cost for transmission, here's the type of uses that are going to um, you know, be excluded, here's ones that are, can, you know, can coexist. And in fact, sometimes they're, they're actually mutually beneficial. You know? I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, all of us probably don't like the offshore oil uh, in Southern California, but it turns out though those rigs, the, the reefs, actually have been pretty good and they're keeping them and they're scuba diving there and they're actually pretty good fish habitat. So we can, you know, if we design the, uh, the wind turbines or anything, we can have some habitat and, and stuff like with that too. So there are ways to kind of combine these things. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked, we have a section on off developing offshore clean energy and it's really looking at, you know, during the Obama administration, we supported and, and got involved with the national ocean policy, which is to, um, Fat Allen, the former commandant of the Coast Guard, said it's like putting urban planning in the water column um, to look at, at where's the right places for, for placement of clean energy that's not in conflict with, uh, um, you know, with fisheries, with, uh, with shipping lanes, with all the multiple industrial uses and, and protected areas, you know, migration of wildlife. Uh, the East Coast is shallow. The East Coast offshore is a very good place for, you know, potentially 50,000 offshore wind turbines where the predominant winds um, could pretty much power the East Coast. Uh, we're, you know, right here, our submarine Grand Canyon, California, we've got, uh, you know, the Continental Shelf's very close. Uh, what they're talking about in Morro Bay is kind of spar systems. They're deep water anchor systems like I've been on on the BP rigs in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere. Uh, maybe California is um, not ideal for offshore wind, but could be a, a model for OTEC, for ocean thermal energy, or you know, become the R&D center for uh, tidal and particularly uh, wave energy, other hydrokinetic systems. I mean, California's been rightly spooked by what happened to us with our experiments in offshore fossils. And we pretty much, you know, I've, I've confronted people at conferences, they go, well, you know, no country that actually has hydrocarbons offshore has ever not drilled them. And I go, well, actually, California society has huge amounts of hydrocarbons offshore, and we're saying no. But at the same time, Peter Douglas, the late head of the Coastal Commission, he said the challenges after he passed would be around agriculture and offshore clean energy and getting California to move into the forefront of doing this work. So it may not be offshore wind. I mean. My friend Sheldon Whitehouse, senator from Rhode Island, he's thrilled that they had the thir first 36, uh, you know, kilowatts of uh, fans of, of 
industrial offshore wind off Rhode Island, Block Island. 36, great. So America's now got 36. Uh, the European Union has 18,000 in offshore wind. So I don't know if, if the West Coast in California in particular is necessarily the right place for offshore wind if we have to hang them on anchors, but it's certainly uh, a center for technological innovation. We've got Silicon Valley. They're developing the cables, the smart cables. Um, we just have to be a leader in whatever's possible offshore. Thank you. Kind of switching gears here and thinking about some of the social aspects of the Green New Deal and your um, document as well. The Green New Deal focuses a large amount on addressing some of these inequalities and inequities in our society, referring to frontline and vulnerable communities. But I think that there's a considerable amount of confusion around how some of these social issues connect to the environmental issues that we're talking about. So can you speak on the connection between the effects of climate change and some of the existing social inequalities? Sure. So we, we already kind of mentioned a little bit with the flood insurance, right? Uh, you know, in a lot of areas, this is, you know, you know, lower and middle income people subsidizing wealthy people, you know, uh, in, in the wrong places. Um, but also I, ports is really a big issue where it's, you have a real environmental justice component. Uh, you know, Oakland up in, uh, we, we've worked in the centers, worked with uh, a community in Oakland where the, the pollution from the trucks and the ports are, uh, is, is really affecting kind of a, a low-income communities right that are adjacent to it. And they, you know, they, they, these, these environmental justice groups have been, they got the, the pollution meters and they've been measuring the, the quantity of pollution. The air pollution is off the charts from all, again, both the ships and the kind of the, the bunker fuel from the ships and also from the trucks. And so they've, the, you know, this greening of the ports would be a huge environmental justice benefit because if you go around the country, most ports, given that the fact that they're big, it's big industrial and it's polluted, it's typically bordered by and adjacent to low-income communities. So if you can green these, if you can make electric trucks, if you can take the bunker fuel out and clean this, you can really have a huge impact on kind of the, the health of impact on these neighboring communities. If you then enter in some of the natural infrastructure, stuff like that, and more beautify these areas and make them not just kind of these stark industrial kind of wastelands, and then you can also help the real estate, maybe put some working waterfronts, and so you can kind of start envisioning the, the greening of the ports being an environmental justice initiative. So this would be one area where there's kind of this overlap, and, and David, maybe you want to share something else. Yeah, or just going off of that, I've got a chapter on ports in my book, in, in the Golden Shore, where I talk about, um, and it's great, I mean, the LA Long Beach complex is the largest port complex in the Western Hemisphere, and yet 15 years ago, 12 years ago, it wasn't growing. The, the marine terminals couldn't get permits to expand because the fence line communities of San Pedro and Wilmington and Long Beach, predominantly uh, low-income communities of color, um, had some of the worst air quality, the highest cancer rates, the highest childhood asthma rates in the state. And so there were neighborhood-based lawsuits against the port. And they brought in Geraldine Nats, who became the head of the Port of LA was not only the first woman, but the first marine biologist to raise, run a major port. And even though when you get there, it's like land of the giants, you, you know, it's got its own AAA map, it's 25 square miles, you don't know what canal the Port of LA ends and the Port of Long Beach begins, but they're fierce competitors. So she held the first joint port commission meeting since 1924 to initiate a cleaner action plan. And I wrote it up in Nat Geo, it was like within seven years, they reduced air pollution 80%. They switched out all the diesel burning trucks. They got the air quality board to ban high sulfur fuels within 25 miles of the coast. They put in cold ironing where you plugged into port power instead of burning bunker fuel, which is the dregs of community health measurements dropped incredibly, got healthier, the lawsuits went away, and the port expansions happened. And so, you know, this is, a billion dollars a day crosses these docks. So this is a great example of when you do social justice, when you do right by equity and the environment, you do right by the economy. And, and that's, that section is saying that we've got models of how to green our ports and shipping and transport and, you know, and can make healthier, fairer communities, communities both human and wild. Jerry's actually on our board for the center, so we, we love that. 
Well, David, I'll go back to you with this one. Um, in regards to the, some of the things that you've outlined in your proposal, ways that you would like to see um, us decarbonize our shipping ports and change the way that U.S. ships and ships entering U.S. waters are fueling their, their journeys. Do you anticipate that that would have any impacts on global trade and trade with other countries, especially at a time where some of our global trade partners are kind of, we're in a bit of turmoil with that. Um, do you anticipate that being an issue or a barrier to some of these changes that you recommend? Well, I mean, yeah, insanity is always a barrier to common sense. <laughs> um, so yes, like uh, the trade embargo with China, China is now providing 70% of the solar panels in the world. Um, but in terms of long-term perspective, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, is beginning to talk seriously about propulsion systems. Something like 8% of our, of our carbon fuels are from the 90,000, 300 ton plus commercial ships that are out there. Um, you can see their, their smoke emissions from satellites. You can sort of track the shipping lanes by the pollution. And, and so the shift from bunker fuel, which like I said is the dregs of the petroleum process, the only thing lower on the chain is asphalt. Um, and, and, you know, and, and how you do that, I mean, Geraldine, when she finished up at the Port of LA, became the president of the International Association of, of Ports and Harbors. And one of the things they came up with in terms of decarbonizing is they give a 15% reduction on uh, docking fees to any ship that's, whose propulsion system is cleaner than the IMO standards. 15% can be a couple hundred thousand dollars for offload, so it's significant. You have just on time shipping systems, which is basically there's no longer warehousing. They know what's coming in, the containers all tracked. Um, and, and so you don't need to speed from the Yokohama to LA. You can slow down the ships, which also reduces whale strikes. Um, you can transition to these new fuel systems. You can add benefits like sails that, you know, on small coastal shipping systems and vessels can reduce, you know, just a sale can reduce, you know, save you 10 to 15%. And it's all very thin, shipping very thin margin. So any way to save money, um, the industry will be a quick adapter. The problem is all those ships that are out there are mostly still burning bunker fuel. And, you know, we need to like do this by mid-century. We can't, you know, we can't keep building ships, including cruise ships that don't have better systems. I was out with the Navy um, and they have the, uh, the Macon Island, which is a helicopter salt ship that burns a combination. It's uh, diesel, electric, and turbine. It burns one-third the fuel of any other ship of its class, a warship of its class. And the captain was bragging that during uh, training operations, the F-14s were burning more fuel than the ship. Um, he said, you know, this isn't the green ship of the future, but it's a great transition. I could see a fleet. I said, nah, $2 billion a pop. I'd rather not see a fleet of warships, but in terms of disaster response ships, sure. Thank you. So I just have two more questions, and then we'll hand it over to questions from the audience. So start thinking about those. Um, how has your proposal been received by legislators or politicians, and have you had anyone kind of sign on with their support for this? So I'll, I'll pass it to David quickly here. but. So far, the, 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 we've been met with very enthusiastically. Again, we want to be clear here. We don't have a proposal that's formulated. We just wanted to start the conversation, and so we're going to continue that again throughout the course of this year. And we, we're pretty confident that, again, these are common sense things. These are things that, that everyone, all states, as a national, you know, are, are very involved with. And in one thing, just encouraging, you know, when, when the Trump administration went to do the offshore oil drilling on the, east, the eastern seaboard, bunch of Republican governors and state legislatures and, and, and people in the federal government were against it. So, you know, the Republicans who actually are, are, have to be accountable to their voters in coastal areas know that they can't do this stuff. So there is some potential for bipartisan. Again, I'm not super, uh, you know, uh, bullish on that, but, but it's possible. And I, think, uh, and I think since we're starting here in California, where we have most of the, the nation's leadership in, in marine policy, I think this is going to be a great start. Yeah, I mean, we literally put it out the first round on, since I left the hard copies at home, you can go to Manga Bay and just put in like Scorch and Helvard and find it. I mean, we put it out in March, so I think that uh, we're getting very good. It's got out with 
sort of in the marine conservation community. Uh, some of the funders are starting to put out their contacts. I went back and left it with 26 key uh, offices on the Hill, um, including one Republican office. Uh, Jared Huffman, who's a California congressman for Northern California, is you know head of the Ocean Subcommittee on House Natural Resources. They have it, are looking at it. They were talking to us about um, first step being maybe reforming the National Flood Insurance Program because there's already bipartisan interest in that. Um, they've given it to Sheldon Whitehouse. I handed it to him. He and, and Brian Schatz on the Senate side are both big ocean and climate folks. And, and if there's a change in the Senate, then I think, you know, if we, we keep expanding with our stakeholders um, and, and growing it out from an outline to a package, um, it's a package that might move. We don't, we don't know, but we're hopeful. Um, again, it's, it's just developing that sense of crisis. And, and, you know, where I live in Richmond, I live on a marina that in World War II is Kaiser Shipyard Number 2. And in four years, between 1942 and 1945, um, they built 750 Liberty ships in this one marina. And, uh, you know, we transformed America into the arsenal of democracy. We stopped producing cars, and there were 60,000 tanks and jeeps that were loaded at the Ford plant there onto these ships. By the end of the war, we were dropping a ship every, uh, every five days. Um, so the, the mobilization is possible. You know, we've got to just recognize that the crisis is comparable to World War II, and at best, we're presently treating it like the invasion of Granada. So, uh, so, you know, we've, in the last century, we defeated two existential threats, you know, the rise of fascism and the nuclear balance of terror, and now this is the existential threat that we have to address today. And one way or another, I mean, it's not, it's coming, you know, it's more or less the question is, you know, these coastlines are going to be impacted. It's, it's how we respond is the question. So in this time of crisis, I think a lot of us become kind of overwhelmed by the enormity of the issues that we're being faced with. Um, and some of us become so overwhelmed that we feel almost incapable of acting. So I guess the question on many of our minds is, what can we do? Um, what can we do to show support in this type of legislation or these types of resolutions? And what can we do on a small scale in our everyday life to, to combat some of these issues so that we can feel like we're contributing something even though we're not all you know, at the top level where we can directly propose some of these really large scale actions that need to happen. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just say that I, I, I'll kind of go meta here for a second, which is you know, obviously there's a many things we can all do as individuals in terms of diet, in terms of not using plastics, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not really up to the scale of the problem. We really need collective action. Individual action is great and I do it all myself but it's not what I want to focus on. What I want to focus on, I'll just say this, as, as a member of the left, I consider myself on the left, the left is always its own worst enemy, right? Because we, we, we want quick revolutionary change in a system that's not designed for it. In fact, the United States system is designed against revolutionary change. Um, and we get frustrated quickly, we get into personalities, we get into little, we, we fight amongst ourselves and we don't keep our eye on the prize. And so what I just think it's a mindset, right? So this is a generational struggle that we're in, right? To, and it's beyond just climate change, right? It's, it's you know, against, you know, forces of, of division and racism, et cetera. It's to, to build a just America is going to take 25, 50 years. So you have to come in with a long-term vision, right? And, and, and know that it's going to be a grind, right? This is going to be a grind. Whoever wins the presidency next year, even if it's someone we like, and even if we win the Senate and we get 51 senators, we're not going to get everything we want in that cycle. And then it's going to go and there's going to be a midterm election and it's going to swing back. And if we get frustrated and tune out, because just remember, the current occupant of the White House got less votes than Mitt Romney. Okay? And last time I checked, Mitt Romney was never president and got crushed. So how did he win with 46% of the vote? It's because five times as many people as 2012 voted for third-party candidates in the three key states that we lost by 77,000 votes. People did the protest vote, they threw it out, it doesn't matter, they're all the same. That we just cannot, as mature adults, afford to be that cavalier with these things. We have to be serious and long-term and sustained, right? Like, you know, and, 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 and again, 
we live in this area, right? We have, we can we go replenish, right? Think about the people living in, you know, Alabama, right, in the 1950s. Think about what they had to deal with, right? Think about, you know, the, the, the people who have really are in World War II, right? We get to go out here and go surfing and walk on the beach with So We can get recharged, right? So just think long term and don't get frustrated if we don't get everything right away. So I know everyone wants the revolution, but that's not the way this system is designed. And maybe we will get there in our lifetime, but that's, it's, it's, a, it's a generational struggle. And I think if you have that mindset, that's the best thing you can have for, for, for what we need to do. Yeah, and just following up, I mean, first of all, yes, uh, you know, Gramsci, Italian anarchist said, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the spirit. And I'm always optimistic coming out of the ocean. So that's a good start. Um, I was body surfing in San Diego last week. I feel much better. Uh, and people would come up to me when I did my first ocean book, you know, and they'd go like, well, what can I do about the collapse of marine wildlife or climate change? And the answer, as we know, is everything we do every day has an impact on the ocean around us. So I wrote 50 Ways to Save the Ocean. And it ranges from what we do as individuals to voting the ocean to, you know, acting collectively. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the stupidest question is always, well, is it personal or political? It's like, do you stop smoking or fight big tobacco? You know, you do, we're, we're sort of, when I was young, it was like, think globally, act locally. Well, now it's like we gotta think and act locally, regionally, globally, simultaneously. It's a challenge, but the more you engage, the more you start, you know, doing the simple things, the more it kind of feels good and you start doing the more complex things and you start becoming part of movements. And, you know, it's, the more you start to alter reality, the less time you have for reality television. So, um, so I think we're at a moment where, you know, I'm hopeful I, this whole, when we did, two years ago, we did the first global march for the ocean. And I got like way buried in getting 3,000 people for our anchor march in DC. But then I found out there are like 140 other marches across the globe. And, you know, a 13 year old organized 500 people in Dublin and a 12 and a 16 year old um, did the march in the Marianas Islands. And, uh, and you know, and they, they, Cape Verde, and this year I sort of, left it behind and just went to the march uh, that the uh, New York Aquarium did on the Coney Island boardwalk, my kind of natal waters where my dad came, came you know, across the ocean to freedom. And, uh, you know, and, and Surf Rider in Paris had 2,000 people marching led by women in, in blue and green body paint. Um, there's this whole cohort of like seven to 17 year olds who are totally mobilizing around plastic pollution and climate. And so my feeling is, you know, they aren't, our leaders of the future. They're leaders today if we partner with them and mentor when they ask us to. And, and you know, there's this new sense of movement. It's totally different from the 60s, but it has the same energy and that we're in a crisis and the crisis has gone global and, you know, we know what the solutions are. So now we have to mobilize the political will to provide the answers. And for optimism, um, you know, California is to me, you know, we're not perfect, but we're scaling up the solutions faster than the problems. We're 40 million people, we're the world's fifth largest economy, and we figured out how to do pretty well by our ocean. And now we have to figure out how to, in October, how to expand our outline into something we can bring to the nation next spring, and then uh, engage everyone who loves the ocean into making sure that there's a, you know, a Blue New Deal as part of the Green New Deal. Thank you very much, both of you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, my name is Beverly Deshaux. I'm with the Electric Auto Association of the Central Coast. Um, we do have uh, semi-trucks now. They're not up to scale, but they are all electric and they rock. Uh, we, uh, there's a uh, ferry that's electric. I think there's only one of them that I know of so far. But I think that you've inspired me to go talk to those Tesla people and see what we could do about the shipping industry. Hydrogen's not so great because it takes twice the amount of energy to just make the fuel to make it go. And also I wanted to ask you, what was the, um, what was the, what is the fuel that's used in the trucks that transformed 
the uh, LA, uh, LA Long Beach uh, Harbor system. And um, one other thing is that there's always, um, so everything that we're talking about here is sort of like after the fact, it seems. Um, big ag is always kind of behind the curtain and never really able to be dealt with. Um, are you guys thinking anything about big ag? I mean, they're you know creating dead zones. They're doing our air, doing our food, doing our people. Um, something needs to be done with big ag. We need to take them on somehow. I don't know if that's some, within what you're doing. Is there anything you're thinking about doing with regard to that? I mean, I'm organizing an ocean panel at the Soil Not Oil Conference September 10th in San Francisco, looking at you know regenerative agriculture and its connection. We had an inland ocean summit at EarthX in Dallas uh, this past uh, spring, in which we had a panel with uh, um, Jeremy Jackson and, and Nancy um, Rabelais, who's the scientist who she doesn't like to say discovered the dead zone in the Gulf, but has sort of popular, popularized it. And Seth, who's sort of a, a rancher in Iowa, who's doing as much regenerative work in terms of the soil operations there. In terms of, you know, the, 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 the more runoff, you know, most of the coastal dead zones are directly tied to big agricultural runoff and KFUs and all that. And the crisis point, of course, is in Florida. Um, when I was, you know, last on the Indian River where they have the blue-green algae, Everybody knew exactly when um, the algae bloom would end because it was when the Army Corps would cut off the uh, overflow from Lake Okeechobee because all of the sugar pollution goes into the lake and because they have, we haven't invested in infrastructure, they're worried that, that they'll overtop the, uh, um, the dirt levees. And so they keep running off this polluted water into coastal waters, which creates algae blooms, which destroys the... So now it's reached the point where um, big ag has had such sway that it's now come up against the big developers, which are the other economic interest in Florida. And so, you know, there's not only this huge public outrage over uh, the dead dolphins and the dead fish and the lost income, but um, the Republican governor who came in as a Trumper is now actually taking a lot of initiatives around reducing agricultural runoff, nitrates, nitrogen, and phosphates because of because it's destroying the coast, which is the you know, tourist economy of the state. Uh, hopefully we don't have to reach that crisis point in general uh, to change our agricultural models. But there are a lot of people, there's a whole campaign around ag as a, you know, as a climate issue. And of course it's all about, you know, for coastal and ocean folks, it's all about the runoff. And so the Inland Ocean Coalition, which in Texas we got three new chapters and now 15 chapters, and Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Iowa, you know, northern New York and elsewhere. Um, and they're dealing with the issues of, of plastic and, and ag runoff as ocean issues. I mean, it's all water and all water connects. I'll, just, I'll put in a 30 second plug on an individual action. If you're going to do one thing for, to get big ag, start moving to plant-based as your diet. That, that is yeah. probably the single biggest single action you can do to reduce your, your footprint. I mean, there are some hybrids, most are still gas, uh, you know, trucks. It's just that they were so out of compliance. The whole fleet had been around for 30 years. So now they're pretty much, you know, modern meeting, you know, fuel economy standards of today, which surprisingly, I mean, it's not where you want to be, but that was 60% of the 70% reduction of pollution, air pollution. It's just, you know, if you don't like have high standards and the truckers association, they kept coming back with threatened lawsuits. And so they sort of built the regulations, um, it, they tiered them. So if they got sued on one front, they went to the next tier of regulation. Um, but you know, the, the uh, import vehicles, which are the lifts and, and the import trucks, um, they're all electric, they're all plug-in, they've got hybrid, the first hybrid um, tugboats are operating in the port there. And, uh, and they're talking about Megalev, uh, you know, tracks for, for, you know, a lot of the port areas have 12, 15 tracks coming in. 
um, using Meglev to move the containers uh, out of the yards and onto the rail cars. So, uh, you know, a lot of innovation taking place there. My name is Susan. Um, I worked on an air quality study for a couple of years um, after having lived in Long Beach, actually. And um, one of the interesting features was the fact that the freeway, which all the trucks go on from the center of Los Angeles County straight to that port, were, were cut in such a way that they cleared a lot of land on both sides of the freeway. And then schools and low-income housing were built there. So it immediately affected the people who lived along that freeway because they didn't improve the quality of the air from the trucks. And I believe it was a tiered system where they actually subsidized the truckers to upgrade the quality of their engines so that they would have less, less pollution. So it was done in a series, and, and a lot of the problem were long haulers who were coming all the way from Mexico and going on all the way to Canada, and then they were dropping off things at the port, and then they were picking up things and going to the next spot. And so they were subsidizing the, the rebuilding of those trucks to, to upgrade them, which is pretty great. And just after I left is when the new regulations went in about the, the changing of the fuel at the 20 mile mark, I believe. And I can recall, you could see from the shore, you could see the, all those freighters coming from China with the big black plumes of smoke, and it, it's not there anymore. So those are two huge improvements. But I have another question. If, if we say there are approximately 20 states that have some coastline, that leaves another 30 that do not. So the fact that you're working with different states to talk about the fact that their rivers are also running into the ocean. To get people to understand that it's not just all those rich people in New England or in California that are living in the ocean and we're worried about the water, but that because you know, people have a short listening time. So they want to hear about all those oceans, or they need to understand that the ocean is actually affecting everybody, every time, the whole planet. And I, I think getting that message across it on a political level, for people to understand that the blue issue is just as important as the green issue, because it's all interconnected. I, I don't, and you had some answers to that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're trying, you know, to nationalize the ocean, get people to understand every state's a coastal state. Um, Vicki Nichols Goldstein, who's on my board, she uh, runs the Inland Ocean Coalition. Um, and again, when we have our, like, Blue Vision Summits, we, we have our Healthy Ocean Hill Day, and suddenly 20, a delegation of 25 shows up on the Colorado, you know, um, congressional delegation, and they're met by 25 people who want to talk to them about ocean issues and find out these people have arrived on their own dime and their own time to do it. Um, so there's a new congressperson in, in Denver who's one of, one of the major ocean activists now. He, he's uh, engaged. We're trying to get that connection. Margot Pellegrino, who's one of our ocean explorers, she's paddled her outrigger canoe from Miami to Maine, and I convinced her to go to Seattle to San Diego. Her last trip was New York to New Orleans. She went up through the Great Lakes, down the rivers, and she's always connecting. Now she's, her whole point was to connect all the uh, water activists and saying it's all about clean water. And so, you know, the people who are fighting the same issues on the Great Lakes or the issues on the rivers or the issues on the coast. You know, my friend who's at the Toledo Blade has been reporting for 10 years on the growth of um, algae blooms, harmful algae blooms in the Great Lakes. It's all driven by the same big ag. It's all you know, water quality is water quality, whether it's, you know, sweet brackish or salty. And I think that, you know, in, in trying to grow the uh, Inland Ocean Coalition, we're trying to talk about water is the, is the thing that makes, you know, where's water come from? It comes from the ocean. So we're all connected. Every other breath is, you know, an ocean breath. Just for questions, if we could try to talk into the mic, we are recording this session so that we can share this with others. 
who weren't able to make it here tonight. So just try to speak into the mic so we can all um, hear you loud and clear. Hi, I'm Jeff Chester from uh, the conservation group Oceana, um, based down in Monterey. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's very, very important, I think, to uh, bring the ocean back into the discussion uh, on, on the overall Green New Deal and climate change. Um, so I deal a lot in fisheries and seafood in that sector. And something I worry about, I guess, in, in kind of looking at some of this, uh, it, it, I guess this happened very recently. You know, there's uh, a lot of efforts now into kind of industrializing the ocean and the promise of jobs that are created there by, by creating um, uh, you know, big, massive fish farms and all of that are, are starting to be sold now as part of this blue economy, right? The promise of jobs. Uh, the promise of these new industries that we can develop, uh, you know, as you know, sh fish move around and all of that. And I worry that a lot of these things may actually be diminishing the resilience by changing from natural systems to human man-made structures that may not be as resilient. And I guess I wonder how we, uh, in, in this whole kind of selling and sales pitch to this, that we don't open the door to uh, perhaps uh, uses and changes in industrialization that may actually be counter to, I think, the overall goal of a more resilient, robust system in the face of climate change. Um, and then just a second question, if you wouldn't, maybe it's a short, shorter, shorter question. Um, I'd love to see, um, you mentioned plastic pollution quite a bit. I didn't see anything that really directly kind of went at that, and I'm wondering if you might be open to thinking about ways that um, a new future and new, in, you know, systems that are not plastic based and, and a transition to those could also be a way to create jobs and be sold as part of this. Yeah, so uh, as great questions, we, we are very cognizant that the blue economy term is being basically any kind of development in the, the, the oceans. And so we, we have our definition on our website that's the World Bank definition, which is sustainable use of ocean and coastal resources. And we're actually trying to operationalize that so that a big, massive fish farm would not be considered a blue economic development, right? So that it's not just anything that's on the blue is blue economy. So we're, now that's hard, that's hard to do because people will misuse definitions and all that, so we understand that. In terms of, you know, the, the, the new economic development that could threaten the oceans, there's no question that there is a lot of that we're going to be very cognizant to make sure that our definitions, our terms, and our, our agenda is clearly on the blue side, the true blue side, you know, that, that, that meets sustainability definitions. In terms of fisheries, you know, maybe probably offline, I mean, you can talk about this. I am, I am not convinced that much of commercial fishing meets any definition of sustainability under really any rubrics currently. And what we're pushing for here, though, which could be a, a blue economic development will be much more um, either kind of maybe some land-based or herbivorous fish aquaculture or plant-based um, ocean systems that are, you know, that are sea vegetables or shellfish. The fin fish aquaculture, we're not too bullish on that. We don't think that that meets the definition of sustainability. So I think we're very much in the infancy now, and we, you know, we'd love to talk with you some more about that. But we're, we're very cognizant of your point that that blue economy can be very much distorted by industry. Yeah, I, I mean, blue economy is the sustainable development of the ocean. You know, it's, it's great rhetoric for industries. Uh, you know, we're now, we had 30 years of greenwashing, we're now seeing blue washing operations. Um, really one of our eight points is marine protected areas. I just, we just did a story for Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue talking about that aspect of our, of our program, that uh, people are talking about protecting 30% of the ocean by 3030. Yeah, you know, it's kind of, huh? 2030. <laughs> well, pace is slowed down. Uh, but, um, right, but, but it, it's, you know, we see the value of uh, healthy ecosystems are also more resilient on land, and so just putting national parks into the water column makes sense, but not just to have biological reserves for the future, there's this whole blue carbon emerging science that says it's not just mangrove forests and eel grasses that, that sequester carbon effectively, but fish themselves and, and krill, you know, krill 
take carbon out of the system and put in their fecal strings that go to the deep ocean. And whales, apparently, you know, when we have larger whale populations, there's more carbon dioxide being taken out of the uh, atmosphere. We had down in Texas, we also did a media training, and the, and the blue carbon people talked about that. And we talked about how you communicate. So by the end of our session, um, we had a, you know, a social media plan on how whale poop will save the planet. Uh, but we do, we do think that it's, it's, you know, as I was saying earlier, you know, um, Tim Wirth once said that the economy is a fully owned subsidiary of the environment. And so when you talk about the blue economy, you're talking about something that exists within a healthy ocean environment, a healthy ocean planet environment. And a lot of that's also going to be having large spaces that are protected as biological reserves and making sure that the migratory patterns which are shifting for wildlife are also adapted to any industrial plans and any kind of marine industry is sustainable in a real sense, that it fits within a larger healthy ecosystem. And, you know, and certainly, you know, that means the, uh, a quick end to uh, offshore drilling and spilling and Ocean has been very engaged in, in the national campaign that's turned pretty much everyone except, you know, um, except the people in power against offshore drilling. Um, you know, plastics is like a solidified oil spill. We, we think that, you know, what we don't have in the eight points is the most obvious, which is a rapid transition off of off fossil fuels. And one of the things that's becoming obvious is that as the oil industry sees that there's a transition to electric cars, to uh, a movement away from petroleum for fuel, they're investing more in plastic. You know, they're looking for, you know, where they can, where they can put their product. And another meeting in Texas I had with uh, some guy who's got this great idea that if you just have informal meetings between environmentalists and industries that we'll just, you know, have a, a good, you know, a kumbaya moment. So it was an opportunity. I asked the guy who represented Exxon, what's, what's your company's plans for stranded assets? The science tells us we have to be all fossil fuels. We can't drill anymore. You've got hundreds of billions of, of you know, dollars worth of oil in the ground. And his response, we don't have plans. We think we'll be part of the mix until, you know, mid-century and beyond. So, I mean, it's like asking the whale oil barons, you know, where are we going to go when we run out of whales? Um, they don't see it. And, you know, obviously it wasn't, you know, the whale industry didn't bring us to rock oil, and the rock oil industry is not going to bring us to, you know, clean, sustainable, job-generating energy, but it's where we got to go in the next 15 years. Um, I was happy hearing you differentiate between sea vegetables and shellfish versus finfish. Um, you know, as we know, the oceans are 70% of the Earth's surface, and I hear a lot about planting trees and regenerative agriculture as ways of sequestering carbon and regenerating the earth. But I don't hear very much at all about the potential for regenerative agriculture, I, I should say aquaculture. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, what do you think it's going to take to get that on the West Coast? I know we're doing it on the East Coast um, with things like organizations like Green Wave. Um, yeah, so I guess that's that's the basic question. Yeah, so we're we're in the you know the beginning stages of this. You know, we have some really good people in the Moss Landing Marine Lab. Some of you all might might know Mike Graham, and, and they're, they they've put in uh, a grant and they've been approved to start an aquaculture center out of of the Moss Landing um, hub, and it will be for the whole Cal State system. We, uh, we put in some grants with them to start kind of looking at the blue economy potential for California. So that would be the first thing, looking at what are the regulatory barriers, what is the zoning issues, what are the kind of species potential, and then exactly what you're talking about, what are the kind of the regenerative potentials, these kind of co-benefits that you're going to layer on top of each other. So it's really in its infancy. Um, and, uh, you know, but we're, you know, Mike is really the leader in this. He has his own little sea seaweed company, as some of you know, and he sells these high-end products to restaurants. And he's, he wants to make California the leader in kind of 
in plant-based aquaculture and, and, and shellfish aquaculture, and I think he is the person to do it. And again, he, he sees he probably it's not going to be the mass stuff that you see in Asia, the, you know, the, the you know, miles and miles of square miles of kind of nori and that kind of stuff. It'll be maybe more artisanal and maybe more high-end stuff um, or maybe stuff that's really um, geared towards you know, ecological restoration and not just you know, um, food. So again, I'm not a, I'm not a marine scientist who, who specializes in this, but we're really interested in this. And I think with his leadership and once they get the designation as a kind of a Cal State Center, I think this could take off in the next decade or so. Anything we can do to help? Yeah, right. <laughs> help on the way. Thank goodness you guys are on it. <laughs> Question about building codes and zoning. Um, I don't. I couldn't find that in your list of it was eight or ten points. Um, and it seems like that's a pretty important issue. I think some place in Scotland, even a, a decade ago, put building codes out so that people couldn't build in places that were closely threatened by sea level rise. In Santa Cruz, I don't think we've got anything. Maybe we do. Um, but the, the city is talking about building a five-story library, a parking garage and library combination right in the floodplain. Uh, it's lower than City Hall, and City Hall is 17 feet above mean sea level. People are just living here is, if we can prevent future problems from happening, you know, you talked about how hard it is to undo stuff. If we can get ahead of the game on some of these things like building codes and zoning, um, could help. Do you have input on that? No, I, I agree. I mean, I think that this is, you know, localizing it is key, and the science has now got resolved enough that we're actually able to localize it. That, you know, years ago, the line that I'd get from the scientist was climate change is real, but you can't attribute any single event to climate change. And now the science is resolved to where they could say 16 to 35 percent of the flooding in Houston uh, during that hurricane was a hurricane. Harvey, was it? You go, Harvey. Um, was attributable to anthropogenic climate change. So uh, September 25th, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, is going to release their report on oceans, the cryosphere, which is ice, and climate. And they're going to like start looking down, drilling down to the regional. And the more places, like particularly the California Ocean Protection Council, can localize the impacts of climate and sea level rise, um, the more we can start to adapt zoning and planning, which is you know, the fight we're having in my town of Richmond, the fight that, that is happening in Ocean Beach, San Diego, everywhere where you have democratic uh, planning groups, you're still having these fights. But now the extra issue is the water's coming up. I couldn't believe. Last summer, I visited my friend Charlie, who's the like, senior cameraman at, at KFMB, the CBS station. They were right on Abbott Street, where he lives. They built like a sort of Newport house type condos, rental units, with the garages down below. I said, that's incredible. That's going to like, they're going to be floating cars. And six months later, he called me laughing. He got like these great videos of this uh, Carmen, uh, this, this um, no, it wasn't a Carmen. It was like a, you know, a couple of Porsches and some high-end vehicles floating out of these garages. So somebody in the zoning commission got paid off, and this is always a challenge. Corruption is the big challenge um, when it comes to like zoning and flood zones. And there are whole systems we talk about. The you know, there's a system called COBRA, which is the Coastal Barrier Resource Act. That these are the areas that are so flood prone along the coast that they're exempted from federal subsidies. And every year, there's a congressman somewhere, or Congress, usually men, um, trying to get exemptions in the COBRA Act so that their friends can build mansions on sand dunes. I'll just say one really quick. You know, we had someone mention plastics. You're mentioning zoning. And you know, we, we set this eight-point outline, but we made the claim we're not, it's not a comprehensive plan. As these meetings continue, 
these issues might come to the fore and we're going to revise and kind of and build this out. So this is why we're having these kind of conversations because we, we know we're, what we did wasn't comprehensive. I think we can do one more question. We saw you over there. just wanted to know your thoughts on the California Plastic Reduction Plan and thinking that that's something that we could all get involved with is, you know, connecting with our Congress people and getting them to implement that. So, so I don't know of the exact plan that you're referring to. So, so that's why I can't speak to that uh, exactly. But again, you know, Save Our Shores has been very involved with this. There's been a lot of state level, obviously. You know, Mark Stone and, and, and um, Bill Monning, who are you know, our, our assemblymen and state senators, have been very much leadership on that. I think what we're realizing is, is we have to kind of go upstream, right? That's the thing, right? Is that these kind of, you know, again, the no straws and all that, that's great and everything, but like, these are probably not systemic enough to really address the problem. And so, you know, Europe has these kind of extended producer responsibility laws, which are kind of life cycle analysis. Maybe that's some stuff, Jeff, that you were speaking to. So I think that's really where we've got to go. There's a really good group I want to point out called Think Beyond Plastic. They're based out of Carmel, and uh, we work closely with them. And so this kind of circular economy, life cycle analysis, that's really the direction because you know, banning plastic bags, banning straws, these things, while good, are not systemic enough or really up to the challenge. And, I mean, I just uh, wrote up my friend Mary Crowley. It's kind of like the question, what can a 71-year-old woman who spent half her life at sea do that a 25-year-old celebrity innovator can't do, which is take plastic out of the ocean? She went out there and removed 42 tons of drift net for 300,000 versus for Ocean, which is a for-profit group, which for a $20 wristband will take one pound of plastic out. I think yeah. her, her proof of concept was 350 a pound, but now she wants to go back next year, remove 500 tons of ghost nets. Um, or you can spend $30 million and remove no plastic from the ocean. <laughs> but the key thing with Mary is she's got a practical system that a lifetime as a mariner taught her to use trackers and then to take you know, vessels out to find the trackers and understanding ocean currents, they realized it's what she called her one tracker many nets theory, which is the ocean separates plastic by weight and shape and density. And so they got to one tracker that was on a 600 pound net, but then they sent up the drones and within five miles they spotted a one ton drift net and a five ton monster drift net. And you know, these are systems, so she, you know, but she's not saying let's just take it out of the ocean. She's saying let's have full cost economics and under full cost economics, the economists will tell you, single use plastic no longer makes sense. So I think, um, you know, and we gotta get others on our side, you know, the big industries, big wax paper, big glass has to, you know, join us in this. And, and I just conclude, speaking of glass, there's a, years ago Dave Brower told me that, uh, you know, the whole point of meetings is to go drinking afterwards, because that's where the strategies get done. And, and as an ocean movement, I feel we have a special obligation to drink like fish, so. <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs> Assembly men and women and senators, not congressmen, right? Yeah. Because it's state level. Yes, so that would it be is the, in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but there is a federal, a, a similar federal uh, proposition. It's Udall and Lowenstein, I think. Sorry. Yeah, that's where I'll probably say it, but I mean, there is one similar in the fed level right here. So we got, we got 11 years, plenty of time, folks. <laughs> <laughs> So I apologize, I thought that was the last one, but did we have another question over here? Um, I, I, I did. Microphone coming away. I'm from Hawaii, and there we have great challenges also, of course. One of the great ones, and this is my question, I'll make it very brief, is uh, so many toxic waste 
dumps and, and landfills and processing plants and waste treatment, all <laughs> at sea level. Uh, that's got to be a big part of what you're doing there. Yeah, so we actually, the center that I work for, we're actually doing a lot of this work, right? So we, we have municipalities that are coming to us and saying, there's all these climate models, there's all this stuff coming out, we barely understand the science right now, then two years later something else comes out, we're making decisions, like you said, for sewage treatment plants, for new parking structures, for zoning that has to last 50 or 100 years, how do we take the science and then translate that into decision making today? Very, very tough problem. These local planning commissions and zoning, you know, groups are, are, are really are, are facing really unprecedented tasks to become kind of master um, comprehenders of very complex climate science. So we're actually developing models to try to take that information and put it into really easily digestible bites. To say, for example, like if this trigger point happens, you're probably better off doing this versus this, or if you know, we're trying to encourage people to take worst case scenarios, because it turns out the science keeps getting worse. So if you take the median or the low end estimate, which people want to do because it's easier and cheaper, then five years later you build that thing that's supposed to last 75 years and it's going to be destroyed in 15. So we're really trying to push the envelope on the kind of decision science. I don't want to claim more than we're doing. It's very much in its infancy, but that's really a lot of what the center's work is, is trying to take the complex science and and make it digestible by local actors who are making exactly these kind of siting decisions that you're talking about. And, and yeah, in terms of disaster response, we have to be have plans in place because otherwise it becomes piecemeal. Where like in Florida, you know, Miami Beach is spending 400 million to raise its sidewalks and and develop new pumps, and their grounding for the pumps are built extra large so they can put bigger pumps in in 10 years. And they've just spent, three, you know, in Tampa Bay, they've had to spend 300 million to upgrade the wastewater treatment plants because solar intrusion is coming up through the, uh, you know, porous ground. So we have to, you know, we've got so much of our infrastructure, not just waste, you know, sites, but power plants and ports and all at, at you know, within the, the range we know that sea level is going to take out, that we have to have plans in place that when we respond to disasters, we don't do what we did after Sandy and rebuild on, on the sand spits. But we, we start moving all that infrastructure and humans back away, and that's, that's the plans we have to develop. Um, it's challenging, but you know, we don't have a lot of choices. centerfortheblueeconomy.org is it's all one word and we'll have all the updates up there there's nothing currently on there because we're kind of in the initial phases but that would be the place to keep abreast of this stuff and also you know bluefront.org same thing we'll just hear what we're developing on these things um, and we'll keep trying to get it out there so we can keep it posted same thing on sorry Matt, so what organizations are you guys working with so I'm with the Center for the Blue Economy and the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. So it's an academic program and it's the same thing. And David's with Blue Frontier. Which is like marine conservation policy. Sorry, what are, are you going to reach out to? Do you need, like, who are you going to be reaching out to as you move forward? Yeah, so we've already reached out to a lot of the government leaders in California, industry, NGOs um, and academics. So we, we, you know, we are so, uh, hoping to have about 50 people in this October meeting for the uh, the meeting in the in the spring. We're thinking national leaders of all the big conservation groups, as well as the Congress men and women and senators and their staff, and some pretty big leaders of industry. So we're kind of going to scale everything from California up to the national level. And like in the last election cycles, I organized. We had a letter of like 100 plus ocean leaders to the two final candidates and it was a range of issues this time it'll simply be the you know what evolves is the ocean climate action and get their commitments on if you know will they move on these these issues and uh, and of course it, you know 
the, the parallel track is, is getting it out there to the large, the millions of people who care and making sure they engage politically. You read more in the books in the back. <laughs> so we just have one final question. Thank you all for hanging in there. I know it's getting late here. We just have <laughs> one closer. Hi, everybody. I'm Gail McNulty, and I'm newly at Save Our Shores. I'm excited to be on the team. Um, and I'm working specifically on climate action and youth leadership. Um, and I'm, I, I think it might be appropriate to close on the idea looking around that um, there aren't a lot of people in the room tonight. And there is another climate thing happening in town. There's something uh, planning for the September 20th through the 29th strike. And I've been going to all of those meetings and I've been engaging in a lot of the climate conversations and the people in this room, it's wonderful to have everyone here. We need more people in rooms like this. And even in what's happening over at the Grange, my guess is there are empty chairs there as well. Um, so to me, this really is, it's a story problem and a PR problem and a sustenance problem. And we, this morning, um, up in San Francisco, the DNC voted, their resolutions committee voted on whether or not to have a climate debate, and they decided not to. Um, we, there was a news story today that the Fridays for Future movement that's happening all over the world, the kids that have been taken to the streets by millions every Friday since October, is potentially waning. Um, I, I personally, if you pick up the newsletter for Save Our Shores, I see this in America. I don't think that movement has ever even started, the children's movement. I mean, we, I'm hoping that we can see some energy build around it, but honestly, I went and spoke to junior guards a couple weeks ago out at Manresa and Del Rey. I spoke to about 80 kids, ranging in age from 12 to 18, and I started off with a question. You know, raise your hand if you have heard about the global climate movement. One person out of 80 kids. Have you ever heard of Greta Bay? Same person out of 80 kids. I mean, and these are kids who are in our classrooms. My kids go to PCS here on the west side. It's supposed to be one of the most college prep classes in town. And climate comes up in an optional, as an optional part of a 12th grade class you know, that you can take if you want to their environmental ed class. So I mean, our kids aren't getting the information. Our press isn't really covering it. We don't even know yet to act. So it's just, it's just a, a thought to leave on. Which I think there's hope for. It. Yes. Our children's trust. Our children's trust is great, and again, our yes, and the average kid in Santa Cruz doesn't even know about it, and so in, in Santa Cruz here, this is a room, this is a community of people that care about the environment and the ocean, and I mean, we are this community. So imagine communities that aren't this central. So it's just, it's just a kind of a thought. I'm not sure if it's actually a question you can answer, but if you have any thoughts on building the story and engaging and sustaining and really growing a movement that kind that we need to truly impact 2020 and beyond quickly. Everyone should call the DNC and give them help. Yeah, that, that's yeah. absolutely yeah. true. That, that is outrageous. Yeah, that's outrageous. I'm just going to say what I said earlier, which is you just got to think a long game. Look, there's going to be ebbs and flows. I mean, that's just the nature of these movements. And, you know, a lot of people wanted to be outside enjoying the ocean tonight on a beautiful night. And I, don't, I don't fault them, you know. So, so it doesn't surprise. Look, I'm old enough now, you know, to know. I, you know, I remember when a president in 2004 used gay marriage as a wedge issue to win an election, right? And now gay marriage is legal. I remember my friends getting arrested for marijuana, and now you can grow it like tomatoes in your backyard, right? So things happen quickly. And like, and they, and they, they, and they don't, and, and, and they, and it seems like they're not going to happen until they do, and then it's like a sea change. So I'm not, I'm not actually so worried that there's 30 of us here. I'm not so worried that you know not everything is packed. I'm not even so worried that the DNC didn't do the climate debate as much as that's a horrible decision. It's just like, just think long term. We we need warriors, like long term thing, and it, we're going to win. I guarantee you. There's no history book that's going to be written that says the white supremacists won. That's, that, that's never going to happen, right? There's no history book that's going to be written that says the fossil fuel industry won. Like, there's just no, it's not happening. Now, we could all, we can all take our lumps and, 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 and lose a lot of battles, but, like, they're not going to win. In fact, my last point here is the reason things are so bad right now is because all these power structures are losing at the same time. 
right? So it's like, it's, it's Christian supremacy, it's white supremacy, it's male supremacy, it's fossil fuel industry, it's the meat industry, it's the gun industry. They're all losing at the same time. And so they're all really angry. But they're losing. This is not a sign of strength. This is a sign that they're losing. People who are strong and confident don't freak out. They don't need to go bully everybody, right? They're confident and strong, right? So this is, to just, just take part in that. I'll drink to that. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Thanks, everybody. So, if everyone would just join us in applauding our esteemed speakers and our comments. And as we wrap up, I do want to say thank you to the 30 or so people that were here tonight. You are leaders in this movement. Keep it up. Stay tuned. Watch what Save Our Shores is doing. We're really focused on that long-term objective. It's really about the long-term and changing, even in the economic sector, it's still about the next quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter. Our legislators think about how are we not going to piss off the businesses because they have the next quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter. It's long-term thinking. We've got to start thinking about the long now. And it starts today, it starts here, it starts tonight. Here are some more Save Our Shores events coming up soon. And I really want to highlight our next Toast the Coast benefit, which is coming up on October 6th. We'll be at the Chaminade. It's a way to focus on what we're talking about here tonight. We're going to focus on our wage makers, our young people who are going to lead the next wave of ocean conservation, of climate change change. Uh, and we'd like to have you all there. You can visit the website, buy your tickets online. We hope you'll come out. It's going to be a great evening to celebrate all that we've already accomplished and then to be inspired about what's next to come. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. As Jason said, I've been watching the kids out there playing in the waves. That's what I'd be doing tonight if I wasn't here. But thank you for taking the time out of your gorgeous evening to sit here with us tonight and hear a very important conversation. Good night, everyone.